All right. So yes, this talk is what should a developer do with data? But this isn't necessarily limited to just developers. So if there are any founders or designers or product managers in the audience, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is uh, going to apply. And just to get started with a little bit of background, um, I began my career as an R&D engineer at Synopsys, so big company building CAD tools, but then quickly realized that I wanted to do something a little bit more exciting. Um, and that's when I um, was recruited to my first startup, which was Mint.com. Uh, for those of you that don't know what uh, Mint.com is, it is a personal finance website. And so it basically aggregates all of your checking, your savings, your student loans uh, into one place so that you get a good picture of how you're doing financially. And this is particularly you know, important to the US market, where a lot of people either don't feel like they have any money, or they feel like they need to know where all their money's going. And it basically helped build Mint, and then at some point we got acquired. This was back in 2009. And so after the acquisition, decided that I wanted to transition from, by the way, can you hear me? OK. Um, wanted to transition from being a founding engineer to actually a founder. And that's when I started BusyBee. And so the, the premise behind BusyBee is that we actually help small businesses with pulling in a lot of variety of data so that they can get a good sense of how they're doing. So we do things like customer relationship management. We keep track of their payments. Um, and then we give them some reporting so that they know their, the health of their business. Now, while I was building both Mint and BusyBee, I started blogging on Femgineer. And Femgineer is a engineering and entrepreneurship blog. And over the last six years, uh, I've built a lot of great content. But in the last year, I've actually made it into an education services startup. So we help tech entrepreneurs as well as professionals with uh, you know, building products, leveling up in their careers, or any sort of professional development. We teach them courses and workshops. A lot of them are online, but a lot of them are offline too. And then most recently, I was invited to be an instructor at Duke. And I talk a lot about entrepreneurship at the engineering school there. So there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about data, especially big data, right? There are a number of companies that are making progress. There's uh, Hadoop that gives you an easy way for you to do a lot of computation and, and, and data crunching. But what we're going to talk about today isn't necessarily big data and their applications. Instead, what we're going to talk about is just data period, right? And we're going to talk about some different situations that people are in, especially given the life cycle that their product might be in. So there's the initial case of you just don't have any data or you don't have enough data to make your product compelling to users. Then there's the case where you might have some data, but it's really noisy. You can't really make sense of it, and you're not really sure what the user is doing, or you're not really sure if it makes any sense to create a product or a feature around it. And then there's the case when you have so much data that you have to figure out how to retrieve it, how to store it, how to keep it secure. So these are all the things we're going to talk about when we talk about a lot of data. And then the final thing we'll talk about is, like I said, how do you actually secure this data so that your users feel like they want to continue working with your product? So to me, there is this life cycle where you start off at the very top where before your product launches, or maybe right after your product launches, you just don't have a whole lot of data. right? How many of you have ever been in the situation where you don't have a lot of data? Okay, fair number of you. So in the case when you don't have a lot of data, or there's not enough data, right? this is where you kind of scratch your head, and you're like, oh, I built all these great features. There are these wonderful graphs, or there are these wonderful pie charts, or there's all these cool features, but there's nothing in here. Nobody's entered any information, so they don't see anything of value, right? This is oftentimes that first time user experience that can make or break someone becoming a user. So the user experience is really what matters here. In the case when you don't have any data, you have to figure out ways in which you can compel people to input whatever it is that you need to then give them information to then go off and do something. So you have to make it compelling for them to want to input data, because people hate entering data, right? Nobody wants to be a data entry person. You know, they want to automate as much as possible. So when we started at Mint.com, one of the the problems that we were having is that 
we wanted to get people's data. We wanted them to give us their bank information and their credit card information. We wanted to be able to create those pretty graphs. We wanted to tell them when their bills were due and when they had overspent on shoes. But we couldn't. And the reason we couldn't is because people just didn't trust a bunch of 20-somethings who were asking them for their financial information. So the first thing we had to do in order to get people to hand over their data is we had to build trust. Now, when it comes to building trust, we actually had to do a lot around branding itself. So everything we did, such as asking people for their bank credentials, for them to enter in their information, we had to convey how secure of a system we were. We had to make sure that the design of it had all these lovely locks on it so that people would feel secure. But we also had to evangelize and educate our customers on why it is we were a secure platform for them to use. Now, it's not enough to just say that you're secure. You actually have to be secure, right? So the second phase of that is we did put in a lot of encryption techniques so that people not only would feel like their data was secure, but that it actually was. The second was once we had gotten this confidence in from our customers, once they were ready to hand it over, right, now they weren't going to sit there and type it in themselves. So we had to make it as frictionless as possible to get the data into the system. So the way that we made it frictionless, actually, was we went in and we connected to a company called Yodely. And the way Yodely works is it actually has relationships with over 3,000 financial institutions. And it pulls banks and, you know, uh, banks and a bunch of other credit card companies. And so it pulls in all of the transactional data. But this transactional data, just looking at it, isn't very exciting to a user, right? So we took that basic transactional data that said, you spent $500 on shoes, you spent $300 on restaurants, and we then created some nice budgets for people. So we automated it, right? Automated the process of putting the data in, and then automated the process of showing the data in a compelling format to the end user. Now, that wasn't enough. We then went on to delight our users. And by that, I mean we took the data that they gave us and made it even more compelling for them to see. So we did things like tell them, hey, you've got a bank fee here. They didn't even know that they were losing all this money on bank fees or that they had overdraft fees. So this was a great case for them to save some money. And then we, we told them, hey, you've got a bill due. You better pay it. So we sent them alerts, right? These were a lot of things that today you see a number of banks are doing or offering us services, but we were actually innovating much earlier because we had access to this transactional data. And we were able to delight our customers. Now, with my other startup, BusyBee, it's a little bit of a different user segment because not everybody is very, very tech savvy, right? These are small business owners, and we, in particular, deal with people who own gyms, yoga studios, Pilates. And so for them, we actually had to take it a step further and create a very, very friendly image of how we operate, right? Because if you walk into a small business, really what you're thinking about is how friendly is the person, right? So given that, we had to create a little bit of a cartoon figure so that they could see that this person is friendly, you know, contrast this to security that we were doing with Mint, and we had to kind of walk them through all the steps, what we were going to do with their data, how they were going to send it to us, and what the benefits were that they would get out of this. Now, even after they give you their data, they're still going to be concerned with security, but they're also going to be concerned with privacy. It was actually a little bit ironic that as I was getting on a plane to come here to London, I get this email from Facebook. And of course, you know, everybody knows about Facebook privacy and all the iterations that they've gone through. Now, the reason that I found this email interesting was because Facebook did a couple things. They actually highlighted exactly how their advertising works. They highlighted you know, what you can expect to be projected to an audience, like your username, your profile picture. And then they explained to you how you can control your privacy settings. And then, of course, what data you're sharing on your mobile devices. It's not just about the web app anymore, right? So they've very clearly articulated what the privacy measures are that they've put in place and how you can also, as the end user, control your privacy. Now, for something like uh, Facebook, this is really important, right? Because people are always up in arms when it comes to their data being in Facebook. 
So I thought that this was a great way to articulate to the public how it is they were managing it. Now, we've talked about people entering in data. And just because they give you a lot of their data doesn't necessarily mean that it's somehow great. A lot of times what happens is people will give you noisy data. So for example, when we were pulling in a lot of transactions at Mint, we were getting things that were miscategorized or things that we weren't even sure reflected a, a credit card transaction or a bank transaction. So we had to actually think about how we were going to filter out all of this noise that was coming in. So the next stage is once you get some data, you then get into this level of noise. Now, the reason that noisy data happens isn't just because of third parties, like I said, with, with Yodely, but a lot of times it happens when you're pulling in multiple data streams. For example, at BusyBee, we have people that send us their Excel spreadsheet with all their customer names, or we have to pull this from their email marketing account, or oftentimes just from you know, some, other, some other source. So when we're pulling in all these various streams, it's easy for us to not make any sense of you know, how we can present this information to them. So it's a little bit noisy to us. The other is a lot of times users themselves, once they start having some data in the system, will do funny things. Right? They might delete some customers. They might delete some transactions. They might rearrange things. And we're trying to make sense of this. Why are they, why are they acting on their data this way? You know, obviously, we gave them the permission to do so, but it doesn't really make any sense to us. And then a lot of the features that we end up building then don't look right. So this is another thing you have to think about is how is the user going to interact with their data? How are they going to change it? And then how is that going to change your presentation of it? So the one thing you have to think about when no data is noisy is how are you going to parse it when it comes in? If it's a lot, you might be able to aggregate it like we did at Mint where we aggregated all of your uh, transactions and then created budgets. Or you might be able to do some interesting mashups. And by that, I mean you might be able to show, hey, here's $50 in credit card fees. If you just paid your bill on time, you wouldn't have that. Right? So there's interesting, interesting correlations you can do. So for example, you know, we obviously showed where people were spending with pretty graphs, you know, both on the web app and the mobile app. But we also did cool things like tell stories. So we took a lot of the data that we were seeing happen in the market, happen with our customers, and we created infographics. In fact, today there's you know, a widespread variety of infographics, but when we were getting started back in 2007, we were actually some of the, one of the first companies that really made use of this visual representation to convey to people you know, a tricky subject like personal finance, or rather a boring subject like personal finance. So think about how you can also pull your user data, anonymize it, and tell a coherent story. Now, you've got this noisy data, and then hopefully you're going to get to a point where you're going to have lots of data, because you get over the hump of having some customers into having a lot of customers. Even for us at Mint and even at BusyBee, we've noticed that every time we add a new customer, we actually, in those first couple months, start to pull in <coughs> a lot of their data, right? Sometimes it's a very, very linear growth, depending on how long someone has been in business, or in the case of Mint, how long someone has <coughs> pulled in, or how long they've been with a particular bank or a credit card. So data can actually start to grow very rapidly. So the key is that we've got multiple streams, not only of user data now, but we've got potentially the application itself. Right? We're looking at log files that we might need to then go and use to debug an issue. Or we might have, like I said before, user analytics, where we want to make sense of why people are clicking on certain things. So at this point, now, what we started off with, which was just user data, has tripled in terms of the number of sources that we're dealing with, right? This adds a lot of complexity to our system. This also adds you know, a lot of necessary storage capacity to put all of this somewhere. Now, the reason that these three sources are important is because a lot of times you'll have users that will complain about the product. Right? There's this concept of um, customer support. And they'll call you and they'll say, hey, this feature isn't working. And sometimes people will be really vocal. And then you'll look through the, the user data or the analytics, and you'll find out only five people were affected out of 
five million. Do you really want to spend your time satisfying those five people? Well, maybe if you're a B2B person or a B2B business and those five customers are really essential, then maybe you will. But a lot of times you want to figure out if this bug is causing a major impact. So you look through the user data. The other, of course, like I said, is you have all of these various sources, right? And the more data you have, the actually more problems you have. The problems are, like I said, storage, capacity, security, and then there's the cost, and then there's the retrieval of all of that. So fortunately, there are some great services that have come around. Amazon EC2 is a great place to store a lot of data, especially backups. Same thing with Heroku. They've made it very, very simple for you to have sharded databases so that you can very quickly scale up or scale down your database depending on how much your data is growing. And of course, they're also very cheap compared to some other companies. Now, because you have all of this data, right, once again, you have to think about how you're going to retrieve this. When you first started building your product, it was very easy to go and find a user and load it all into memory. And of course, you know, maybe it's the user's memory in their browser or on their computer, depending on the type of application you have. But as you start to, to grow their, their data, it doesn't make sense to retrieve all of that, right? Facebook doesn't retrieve all of your photos anymore. It might have done that back in 2004, but in 2013, it certainly doesn't do that. So now you have to think about how you're going to retrieve this. And of course, how you're going to then even store it. So how many of you are familiar with the concept of warehousing data? OK, a few of you. So the concept of warehousing is you just start to accumulate so much, and you need all of it. You can't throw it away. And, and, and the reason you need all of it is that you might do something important with it later on, or you might, it, it, depending on the application that you're working on, like if it's something uh, like in biology, you might need to actually warehouse it so that you could do more computation, right? But leaving that aside, the reason warehousing is, is, a, is, a, is necessary is not for user-related actions, but if you want to take that data and do some future computation with it. Or if you just decide that you need an archiving mechanism, warehousing is good for that too. So there's a couple companies, like I said, Teradata and Hadoop, that specialize in this. And then, of course, it's not just to good enough to warehouse your data. You then also have to do some distributed computing, right? So once again, these two companies will compute the data as well as cluster it or store it. Now, remember I said before, you can't retrieve the entire data set. So fortunately, there have been a couple solutions to this. You know, obviously, um, there is a NoSQL database where you can store things in memory. How many of you are familiar with NoSQL or okay, a few people? So th there's this concept where it's just basically a key value pair, where you're not actually storing things to a database. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the value of having a database that you write to. Uh, but just to give you a concept of, of, of MongoDB, you know, basically it's a faster way for you to look it up. You don't have to go out to disk. The other is, of course, caching, right? So Memcache, I believe is how you pronounce it, um, is another service that's basically uh, offered on Heroku as an add-on. And you can use this to then cache all of your uh, important user data. But of course, as you know, the purpose of caching is that you want to just pull in a limited data set, and that data set's going to be based on the frequency that you believe that user is using. So now you've got to do a couple interesting things. Not only do you have to retrieve a subset of data, you have to figure out what's the most frequent, so you have to go and look at user analytic data to figure that out. Right? So now you've got to think in a few different dimensions and a few different data sets. So, now that we've got all this great data, and now that we've stored it and we've retrieved it, we come to the last and most probably important aspect, which is that we have to secure all of this. This is very, very often overlooked, right? And as you've probably all been keeping up with the news, there's a number of NSA issues and all these things going on where people are getting more and more concerned about their data, regardless of whether it's just their Facebook profile or financial or biological, whatever it is. So the key thing that we oftentimes overlook is that we have to give access controls to a number of people, right? We're going to give employees access. 
we're going to give users some level of access. And then we might just have outsiders, whether they're consultants, revolving employees, or you know, just a, a demo user. And so we have to think about how it is and what it is they're able to access. This is why we have to think about how our data grows, how we need to silo all the various sources, and then who it makes sense to give access to. But too often, I've seen companies where the employees basically have access to everything when they didn't need to necessarily, right? Or they've given access to an outsider that they haven't then revoked after the outsider left, right? This is where a lot of times these security breaches happen. And if any of you use those lovely USB sticks, you know, that's another great form of security breach. So there are a number of companies today that will help you with securing your data. Right? There's RSA, which actually issues a um, private and public key, which your employees can then use if they're going to uh, access a network that's outside of a secure private network. Um, there's obviously Trusty, so that they go through and they'll actually um, you know, verify that you are keeping up with certain standards of compliance when it comes to your data. And of course, the final is VeriSign. Now, how many of you are familiar with the various kinds of hats? OK, a good number. So just to, for those of you that don't, you know, there's basically three types of hats, or basically three types of hackers. Right? There's the white hat hackers, uh, or the people that wear the white hats. And, base, and what they're doing is you actually pay them to search through all the vulnerabilities in your code base. Then there are the black hats. Right? These are the people that I've heard um, periodically take down campus parties, internet, which is why we don't have Wi-Fi here. And then, of course, there's gray hat. This is a little bit, as the name suggests, ambiguous. But these are also people who oftentimes you can hire to then go and do a security check on your system. And the reason that they're called gray hats is because they're not affiliated with a particular company, meaning they're not getting paid to actually go in and expose vulnerabilities, but they are hacking around to see where there are vulnerabilities. And once they do, they'll expose them and let the companies know. So this is basically called responsible disclosure. How many of you have gone through responsible disclosure? It's a fairly new concept. So the concept of responsible disclosure is actually driven by social responsibility. You know, as people who are building products we, and companies building products, we feel that we should be responsible for users' data. And so what we'll do is we'll put out a notice saying, whatever gray hat hack hackers are out there, if you find vulnerabilities and you report them to us, rather than leaking them to the public, then we will fix them in a certain amount of time. And then once we fix them, you know, we'll obviously, before or after, pay you for exposing those leaks. Right? So we, we need help. We kind of want to crowdsource the leak finding process, but we don't want them going out and telling the media about it. So there are a few companies that are already doing this today. Facebook, Google, Mozilla, and Barracuda Networks. So if you are interested and if you're concerned about your company's data security, then you should certainly look into this responsible disclosure. So to review, we've talked a lot about data today. We started off by saying, what do you need to do if you don't have enough data? Right? And that's that you have to build a compelling enough user experience. And a lot of times, that compelling user experience is making it so that it's frictionless for people to enter their data. And then, of course, once they've entered it, you delight them. right? You offer them some benefits to having entered their data. And then we talked about once, once you've done that, you might get into the stage where the data is a little bit noisy, right? either because you're pulling it from a number of vendors, or the user behavior is complicated. You just can't make sense of it. right? So you have to think about how you can parse through some of that noise and once again create compelling features. Then we talked about the fact that as you start to make progress, you're going to have a lot of data. You're going to have multiple streams of data. You're going to have your user data. You're going to have user analytics. And then you'll possibly have all these logs that are keeping or monitoring the product itself. Right? You're going to have to merge all of that together and figure out how to store it, how to retrieve it. And then, of course, finally, how do you then secure it? And, and the big thing with security is that you take some precautions ahead of time. So we just talked about the concept of this responsible disclosure. That's one. The other is you can actually go out and hire people, you know, the, the white hats, to come in and hack your system and expose all of those vulnerabilities. The key, of course, is you've got to go out and fix those vulnerabilities. 
All right, so if any of you want to talk more about data as it relates to your product, I do hold office hours. You can book yourself some time on my website, Femgineer. I also do some online mentoring with tech professionals. It's bi-monthly. We do it across um, the globe. Try to find a time that works across a bunch of time zones. And then, of course, I have a number of engineering product management courses that I teach online and offline if you're interested. With that, I'll switch to Q&A. Thanks very much for the sure. talk. Um, y you've actually answered a question that uh, I've always had about Mint, which was really where did you get your data from? Oh, yes. So, um, uh, yeah, could you just, I'm, I'm kind of interested, could you tell us a little bit? It was Yodely, did you say? Yes, so uh, there's yeah. basically two data aggregators in the uh, financial tech space. One is called Cash Edge, and one is called Yodely. And Yodely, I think, was founded in 99. And what they did is they actually went out and established relationships with 3,000 of these financial institutions, mostly in North America. So there are some Canadian banks in there as well, which is another reason that Mint is only in those geographies. Um, but then they would screen scrape all the banks to then pull in the transactional data. So presumably that's why we never got Mint in the UK, because I, yeah, I, I that's really... That's actually not the reason you oh, didn't get it? Mint. No, there were a couple reasons you didn't get Mint in the UK. Um, the first actually is that. The second is uh, we weren't sure if there is a culture here of personal finance, and, and in, in Europe in general, because it would have probably not just been the UK, it would have been all over. Um, so the time we launched 2007, um, and then 2008 and so on, um, we felt like people maybe weren't as budget conscious as those in the US. The other thing is, um, to your credit, you all use fewer credit cards than we do in the United States. And so we knew that maybe it wasn't a market that we could easily monetize in, um, and that people really didn't have all these multiple accounts. Maybe they had one bank card, one credit card, and then a loan of some sort. So that was the other reason. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks a lot for the talk, great talk. Um, just wanted to ask, what would your advice be to a team which is setting up a recommendation system or building a recommendation system from user data? What would you advise as the technologies or the starting point to look at in building a very basic system, which is something that could evolve into being something very sophisticated with machine learning, et cetera, in the future? But where would you recommend starting out as? Yeah, well, the, the, the problem always with those user-generated content sites or, or products is there is a threshold where um, you have to have enough people that are recommend, you know, offering ratings or willing to offer ratings. And then there are those that will benefit from those ratings and hopefully come back. And so that experience has to be very, th that first time experience where there are no reviews, there are no ratings available, that has to be compelling enough for them to then go and write Sure, okay. no, I mean uh, recommending a category of product. For example, if you're looking at something of a certain genre, okay. how do you recommend building a system where you can recommend to a user who's expressed interest in something, uh -huh. things which are similar to what they may be interested oh, in? Oh, okay, so like, like, like what Amazon almost. does where yeah, it says, exactly. you've bought this, you need yeah. to buy this. How would you start that off? Which kind of technologies at a very small scale, basically? Sure. Or at a very early stage, how would you begin that? I think you would need to figure out how to get the initial products into the system, meaning the initial transactions. So what are people first purchasing? And then once you've got a sense of what they're purchasing, then you need to figure out, okay, were there any returns or exchanges, right? All these user actions that make, might make the data noisy. Uh, and, and then you can't suggest things if they didn't ever use it, right? Um, when you then have enough of a, here are the, the various like taste preferences, then you can offer suggestions. Um, but I think that, that transactions are the first. The second is having a level of inventory, right? So even if you're going to suggest other products, you need to know what those other products are, and you need to have some system of classifying them like the one that they just purchased. Um, and then the final is, are they actually gonna wanna go and purchase that similar item? 
right? Maybe if they already, it, depending on the type of item it is, like if I've bought a blender and I love my blender, I'm not going to go out and buy another one just like it a month from now or six months from now. So there might be some time gap involved. So you have to think of some of those user actions as well. Does that help? Yeah, any technologies that you recommend for a, a small startup which they could use which would help with this? Or uh, anything that jumps to mind? You mean like a s technology stack? Yeah, tech stack. Um, well, I mean, I love Rails now. Uh, so I basically, like I built BusyBee on Rails yeah. before Mint was built on Java. Um, it really comes down to... No, I mean on top of Rails. On, on top of let's Rails? Let's say Rails is your foundation. What else would you use to build sure. a strong um, recommendation? So we do some stuff on with JavaScript on the front end or jQuery. <laughs> uh, but I don't, I don't know. Are you no, asking? don't worry. Okay. I'll ask, I'll ask Are you asking, like, is there a data source that you can pull in? Yeah, something which, which manages the recommendation data. Or oh, uh, that I think you've got to build. I think if that's going to be your secret sauce, yeah. then that's something that you're going to have to, to build. Okay. Yep. Yeah. There might be some engines out there for that. I'm just not familiar. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, you just showed us a nice model of the evolution of data. Yeah. How could you, or I was wondering whether you anticipated that evolution in your design or if your architecture evolved with the circle. Yeah, that's something I learned at Mint and then could, can now apply to all the other startups uh, that I'm involved with. Um, but no, that is not something that I thought about initially. In fact, one of the conversations that we had very early on, um, the first nine months after we had built our prototype was we hired our VP of engineering and he came in and said, well, this is great prototype, but it's not secure. So we basically had to then you know, rebuild that entire prototype before we could launch. Um, so that was kind of the first iteration. And then when we wanted to scale, we had you know, a second and a third iteration. So yeah, it's always an evolution and it's always layers. Um, the question becomes how much of it do you start from scratch and how much technical debt do you accrue? So for example, with BusyBee, we have two products. One is a membership manager, which is like a CRM solution. And then we have another one that handles um, billing or payments, so recurring payments to, to members. And my co-founder was so adamant because we had so much technical debt in the membership manager that he was afraid of moving people's money and causing any problems. So we built the second product from scratch, um, you know, using all of our learnings and having a solid base. So sometimes you have to do things like design trade-offs like that. Great. Do you have any advice how to jump over this learning curve and maybe use a more a stack where people have good experience with? I mean, you mentioned MongoDB, which is yeah. one of the best. In this. Well, it's not about jumping over the learning because truthfully, um, you know, you don't know what how people are going to react to your system. Right? So yeah, you could use something like a MongoDB to start and have a lightweight database. But then once you get to like a thousand or a million users, MongoDB might not be what you want to use, right? Um, or you might have to change the configuration. Um, but if you've taken any computer science classes, you know that premature optimization is the root of all evil, right? So you don't want to you don't want to go down that path too early on. Um, but you have to monitor what your application is doing, and then you have to think about how are you going to go in and refactor that code base? How are you going to re-architect the system? Um, a lot of times when people start, you know, they've just got one server, one application, that's it, one database. And then as they start to acquire users, then they break it apart. That's what we did at Mint. That's what Airbnb has done. Um, we do that to some extent at BusyBee. We're not quite to that level yet. Um, but it's OK to have those kind of growing pains. Yeah, could you please finish your thought about the threshold? You were talking about content-generated websites, I think ratings and stuff. The threshold? Yeah. Yeah, so what I mean by that is, you know, when somebody comes to uh, um, a ratings website for the first time, there's not going to be any ratings on there, right? So the experience can't be, this is a ratings website. It has to be something else. You want to compel them to make a rate, like issue a rating or put a review on the site. Um, and so... The threshold is at some point there are enough ratings where it becomes a little bit more viral. So people come and they say, oh, you know, Joe left a rating. Oh, that was really good. You know, I want to, now I want to add to this, right? Um, and so those kind of nuances only happen after a certain threshold. And it's hard to say what that number is. It really depends on the site itself. 
Um, I know, for example, one company, um, Olark, that I know the founders really well, they do live chat and uh, on, on e-commerce and other websites. And for them, um, because they offer this live chat, it's kind of like a, a sales mechanism or a support mechanism. And they started off in 2008, and between 2008 and now, they've got over 10,000 customers because those initial set of customers um, took off. Like, they were, they were startups that did really well. And then a bunch of other startups came and saw this little chat box, and then they wanted that too. So then there was this ripple effect where the word of mouth got out and it became really compelling to use it. Um, to now, anybody that starts an e-commerce site puts that chat box on there. So like that, depending on the type of product you have, you have to have a certain threshold before it makes sense um, you know, to, to do certain, like, certain product features. Uh, so that's why I say you have to look at that. Think about that. Yeah. Um. Uh, two questions. Um, first of all, the one, the first one is related to that. I didn't. I was not here till 15 minutes, so okay. I'm not really sure if we've talked about it already. Uh, but um, I, I think your cycle should actually start from when you have big data, uh, or maybe collect a lot of data after you, had, because. If you have um, some data and, you, like you say, it's, it's noisy, you don't know sure. how, um, you can't really infer anything from that because it's noisy unless, unless you know how to denoise it. Um, right. Uh, but, I mean, and, and the question is, um, if it's noisy data, then how do you use that n noisy data to get, uh, m get more customers so that you go to um, the big data? Um, yeah. That's a very good question. Okay. Um, so a lot of times, like let's take the simple example of um, a biological application, right? We might want to test somebody's glucose measure, right? And we're going to pull in a lot of different sources of data in order to figure out what level their, their glucose is, right? So we have a hypothesis of all the different data streams that we need to pull in to figure out what the measure is. Now, when we pull in all of this, it can be really noisy. Right, so we have a hypothesis of what the streams are, and we know what the data should look like. We know the things that we should filter. So the reason I, I say this is, it's not that you're just given a stack of, of crap and you have to weed through it. You know, you start off with the hypothesis of, I want to take a glucose measure, or in the case of Mint, I want to see how much people are spending on shoes. But I might get some transactions that, um, you know, are categorized as shoes and some that aren't. So I might have to do a little bit more work to figure out the appropriate categorization. Similar with glucose, I might know what the streams are and I might be able to parse it. So it, it's important to figure out how you're going to filter it, right? It's not that it's so massive that you are looking for a needle in the haystack. That's, that's the first. The concept then of how do you transform that into big data is now you've got you know, one person's glucose measure, you've got one person's financial uh, information. Now we want to get more people. Right? That's, that's what we talk about here when we talk about big data, is getting more users. Sometimes it's more users. Sometimes in the case of like, you know, organisms, it's just let's find you know, more streams that we can pull in. Right? So there's a variety of applications. Um, in particular, people when they talk about big data, they just mean that it's, it has to all be um, compute. We have to do some com computations on it. We have to figure out how to store it and retrieve it. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. But when I talk about noise, I don't mean you don't know what you're doing. You do have a hypothesis. You do know what you're looking for. But you have to figure out how to create the filters. I guess you mean that the risk is a little bit higher at that stage. And yeah. maybe if, if you want to invest uh, on, on, on a product, uh, you wouldn't know and you might actually go the wrong way. Right. But anyway. Um, well, the yeah. reason, the reason I, it's I noisy is because you aren't necessarily the one who has access to the initial stream that's coming in. Okay. Okay. A lot of times you're pulling the stream from a third party vendor, or a lot of times you're pulling in multiple data streams, so you have to kind of parse through a lot of that noise okay. un until you can kind of control the destiny of having uh, clear data. Cool. Um, my, my second question is about um, the data that you're, um, so you know about Google uh, getting the Wi-Fi names or is it MAC address of them uh, all around the world and uh, being sued by, by them. Uh, so um, w what type of data is generally 
Suable. <laughs> what is safe data and what can we collect? Like, I mean, there's many things around us that we can collect, but at the end, uh, I mean, for me, if I want to start like tomorrow, I right. definitely need a, uh, money to pay a lawyer to get me through this. Um, That's a good point. So, I, and I, unfortunately, I don't know the specifics of the Google case to give you a little bit more guidance. The kind of big three. I would say, depending on the type of product you're building, are financial, everybody cares about their money, uh, health, everybody cares about any biological information or previous health records, uh, and some people don't care about this, but a lot of people do, is, is location data. And I, my hypothesis is that in the case of Google, having that MAC address helps you then locate somebody, and that's what people are up in arms about. So, so typically, it's one of these three, and then of course, people, you know, may have more that they don't, they do, or they don't want to share. Um, um, so, thanks. Um, that yeah. answers okay, quite, quite well. Um, but uh, just two point, yeah. uh, two point one question. Uh, if if I don't have a lawyer, then who am I going to ask? Like, who am I going to? When you started, how did you get through this? Uh, the the legal part of it. Actually, did have a lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the first thing you got to do is, you know, when people sign up for your website, they got to check that terms and conditions. So you got to write the terms and conditions and privacy policy. So you do need a, 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 some form of a lawyer or some sort of template okay. where you highlight what you're going to do. Um, the bigger thing, you know, I think that people get up in arms about is when they don't understand what it is that you're doing with your data. And so that's why I say with Mint, a lot of our education was we don't have access to your credit cards. We cannot move your money. We don't have account number access. We encrypt all of your passwords. We had to do that level of education before people felt comfortable. And even then, you know, there was only so many people that felt comfortable. It wasn't like the entire um, United States. So there is a level of education and then a, a level of follow through. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I guess this is a bit of a cheekier question. Um, have you have you ever worked out anything from user data that you've decided really that's too creepy to use in the product? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that it? <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. I think I think um, you know, it, w it was kind of funny. Sometimes it w wasn't <laughs> like we had these ideas that oh well you know we can kind of figure out based on what people are buying, what their personas are, right? So if someone's buying like a lot of porn or if someone's buying a lot of food or if someone's buying a lot of shoes, right? But that might not be the route that we want to go down. We don't want to label someone as like a fashionista. Maybe they don't want that. Um, so we had to be careful about uh, using, using data in that way. Um, the other interesting, I think, uh, use cases that we thought we could be beneficial in was because we could track people's financial s streams and the locations that they were coming from, we could then do some level of fraud detection, right? So like the case of um, the, the velocity monitoring. Uh, so we thought that that might be a cool direction to go in. We didn't quite go there because we felt like we weren't accurate enough. So when you know you cry wolf, you got to make sure that there actually is a wolf, right? And I think that's a lot of what we were trying to, to be wary about when we exposed um, data. Even when we did things like said, oh, you spent too much this month on this or that, people were like, well, who are you to tell us that we're spending too much, right? So you got to be careful uh, about those those sorts of things. Um, I think you know a, a lot of it comes down to understanding your customer, their mentality and what they w would find delightful and what, yes, they would find just creepy. Um, there is this case, I believe, back in the US, or maybe it was actually here in the UK or in Europe, where um, there was a young girl who had bought a pregnancy test, and she was pregnant. Uh, and I believe she was underage. And then um, someone sent a coupon home um, saying congratulations on your pregnancy and her father found it 
Well, we know what happened after that, right? So things like that where people think they're being useful and aren't really being useful, I think you have to be careful about. Thanks. Okay, uh, you've talked just now about uh, knowing your customer, which for me means interpreting data. I'm from a marketing background. I'm not from the engineering you know, sure. background. So who's responsible for that? Because engineers, they know how to develop, how to retrieve data, how to organize data, but yeah. who interprets that data? Um, well, there's actually a little bit of a, uh, I would say, conflict. A lot of people think that you need to look at user data in order to figure out user behavior. It's not always the case. So one example is um, Lululemon. They actually don't just look at whatever people are searching for on their websites when they're selling them yoga pants. They actually get into the store and look at people's behavior. They look to see if people are trying on certain sweaters, why that sweater fits and why that doesn't. So it's not enough to just go look in a database or to tell an engineer to go look in a database. You actually have to be there in front of the customer and see how it is they're interacting with your product. Um, which then gets into things like usability testing or user testing. So you want to see how they interact and what they're thinking about because the data doesn't always tell a very coherent story. It tells half the story, which is, oh, they clicked on this button or, oh, they set up this budget or this alert or something like that. Um, so I would actually say, at least the way that I've worked in most companies is it's up to the engineer to store it and secure it and retrieve it. Um, but a lot of what has to happen is marketing or product or biz dev has to say, here's what we're looking for, right? Here's our hypothesis. We want to see how people, how engaged people are or what people are purchasing or how they're interacting with our product. You figure out what the queries are to then tell that story. So you kind of have to actually work together. Um, the engineer isn't going to be able to figure out what the marketer necessarily wants, right? Um, but at the same time, the engineer has to also realize that the customer cares about security and a good user experience and wear that hat in relation to the product. Everybody questioned out? Any more questions? Last round? All right, guys, let's hey, give her another you. round of applause.